Good afternoon and welcome to AgriFood Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. Uh, my name is Tom Bunn. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. AgriFood Conversations is all about driving innovation in ag. Each month we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture. This month's theme, however, is new innovations around business models in agriculture. And on today's call, we are joined by Virginia Emery, the CEO of Beta Hatch. Beta Hatch grows insects for food, feed, and fertilizer. Their insect rearing technology converts, converts mealworms and their waste into high value proteins, oils, and nutrients for agriculture. Their IP enables insects to cost, cost effectively meet the global scale of demand for animal feed and crop fertilizer. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Beta Hatch's market. You are potential customers for Beta Hatch's products. You built a company similar to Beta Hatch, or you are a sophisticated business person or an agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities that Beta Hatch may face. Before we get started, we do have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. Additionally, a few process comments uh, while the poll is running. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Beta Fetch find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all also on mute. However, you can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. Finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Virginia Emery, the CEO of Beta Hedge. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to share more about our company and how we're uh, industrializing some new technology for uh, the future. So obviously, we are uh, here recording this in June in the midst of uh, a worldwide pandemic. There's been a lot of discussion around the food supply chain and a lot of speculation that the food supply chain is breaking. Um, I think we have yet to see what the true impacts are going to be, but it, without a doubt, we know that there's uh, been a huge disruption globally in our food systems. Um, I think a lot of people are looking at this potentially as a problem, but as an entrepreneur, of course, we see this as an opportunity. Um, we're seeing a lot of innovation being really skyrocketed to the, the front of, uh, you know, consumer attention because we're seeing these challenges that need to be innovated uh, and we, we have a real need for new solutions to be developed. Uh, animal feed in particular is an area that we do need to see a lot more innovation. It's a cornerstone of the food supply chain. Feed is food, so it's a regulated product. We need to have very high quality production. Most of the ingredients in the supply chain are harvested just once a year, so it's a very seasonal type of market even though the demand is year round. And a third of all the crops that we're already producing go to feed animals. So we need to start thinking outside of the field for solutions. Feed is the single largest cost of producing our meat. So it's a very expensive part of the meat supply chain. So we really need to start seeing some evolving uh, changes in this industry. That question of feed versus food, <clears throat> this is just a map to show a little bit how uh, much feed directly competes with food production in, in different parts of the world and in this country in particular in the US. We see a lot of emphasis on feed production from the crops uh, growing in our fields and we think there's a lot of need for looking outside of that field-based concept. Um, we also have a huge amount of waste in the system. This is across different parts of the supply chain and so we're really needing to, to think about supply chain innovations to really change what this equation looks like. Beta Hatch is working to solve these problems, um, and we are doing that with a new crop, insects. Um, we're doing this for a sustainable food supply chain. We grow the mealworm, which is a type of beetle. Um, it's also known as the darkling beetle. So the adult's a beetle, they lay eggs, those eggs will hatch into uh, the larva, um, which is also known as the mealworm. This is the life stage that we harvest. Uh, a subset of those animals will become pupa and then transform again into beetles. Um, this full life cycle, um, is very complex. And there's a lot of technology required to do this predictably. But we're able to get uh, a large volume of two products, FRAS. This is the insect manure. Um, it's a, a very valuable fertilizer product. And the mealworms themselves is an animal feed ingredient. 
mealworms are the first crop that we're working on um, and we grow them because they're a super bug. So unlike a lot of these other ingredients that are very seasonal, we can produce them year round, um, allowing us to have continuous supply that matches that continuous demand. We can grow them virtually anywhere. We've done this out of converted office space. We're working out of converted warehouses right now um, and a brownfield approach to scaling. It's a dry adapted bug, so we can grow it with very little water. Um, and as nature's biorecyclers, most bugs have uh, great potential in digesting all kinds of organic inputs, but mealworms specifically have real interesting digestive powers. Um, as a natural part of diets, there's value beyond just nutrition, functions like prebiotic um, roles in the gut that improve animal health. And we have an incredible nutrient density um, in these ingredients. So, you know, the food system works best when it emulates nature. We see this in polyculture, um, no-till, we see this in a lot of different places in the food system. And insects have never really been part of that industrial um, food production, but I think we have a real opportunity to be developing insects in ways that mirror their roles in nature. They're nature's biorecyclers and the foundation of most food chains. On the waste management side, we know that they're little digestive powerhouses, mini bioreactors. Um, the only known way to break down polystyrene is in the gut of a mealworm. So we have not just organic, but inorganic materials that these insects can be eating. And specifically, we've been doing a lot of development around mycotoxin contaminated crops because mealworms can actually break down those mycotoxins and eliminate them. So it's not just that they're not accumulating those ingredients or those toxins, but they're actually breaking the very molecules down in ways that are detoxifying that contaminated feed. On the animal feed side of the equation, we already know insects are a natural part of animal diets. In some cases, the entire diet is insects. Um, the chitin and some of the antimicrobial peptides in insects decrease the need for antibiotics and can improve gut health in a whole different range of animals. Uh, in broilers in particular, we're seeing things like a higher conversion rate of the entire feed ration, which means that animals need less feed overall. So we're talking about an ingredient that's not just a replacement for protein in the diet, but actually has value add beyond just calories. Um, a lot of companies are seeing some of these opportunities and I think you know, there's this um, great diagram by Bueller that I wanted to just highlight, this idea that insects contribute to a circular economy. And this concept of circles sort of bringing, closing those gaps uh, in the supply chain is one that is recurring across uh, insect production. Bueller and their partners Protex have really focused on the black soldier fly and for those familiar with the industry this is where there's been a lot of emphasis. So I wanted to just highlight some of the advantages of the mealworm. We're focused on this meal, the mealworm right now because they're uh, a little bit hardier, more forgiving insects, and they're more amenable to automation. One of the biggest differences is that they're a dry adapted insect. So whereas the black soldier fly needs to have a diet that's kept at about 70% moisture content, the mealworm can survive on a completely dry diet. Um, and this gives us a lot more flexibility in our production system. We don't need to have fermentation on the front end of the process and composting on the back end, which also makes our whole uh, facilities requirements more affordable uh, and more streamlined. So there's a lot of uh, value in the mealworm over black soldier fly from a production standpoint, but also nutritionally. Um, a lot of value as well. It's more nutrient dense, a higher fat content typically, um, and, and just generally this idea of producing our feed in this controlled way allows us to have uh, much more control over that process. There's no heavy metals. Um, we know there are no diseases in these ingredients. The supply chain can really be shortened, um, and so some incredible opportunities for us to, from a performance standpoint, also be delivering a lot more value to our customers. So I wanted to spend a little time today because the theme this month has been supply chains, talking about our operating model um, and what Beta Hatch does differently. We operate what we call our hub and spoke approach, and this matches other livestock production. Um, at the hub, the hatchery, we focus on egg production. This is where most of our technology lives. Um, it's you know, the most difficult parts of the life cycle, and so Beta Hatch um, will always be owning and operating these hatcheries. But the ranch, you know, you can think of this almost as a feedlot for bugs, where we go from just the egg to the harvested larval product. This is a fairly straightforward process. And so um, we've separated out these two functions across our supply chain. We also have a modular approach to how we produce. The tray is the basic unit of production. Um, there are some non-tray based methods. I'm happy in the Q&A to dig into why we've gone with this approach, but that tray allows us a huge amount of control. We can combine them into units on a pallet, 
um, this growing unit, um, which is a, a set of trays, can then be stacked um, using the vertical space in a grow room really efficiently. Um, we always have modularity even within a single facility um, in order to reduce different biological risks that can happen when you have um, a lot of insects at high density like this. Um, but the approach has been very much uh, as turnkey and plug and play as possible, including things like looking at ways to uh, use prefabrication across both our construction of the growing spaces and our processing equipment. So, you know, why we got on this hub and spoke approach? It's not just a question of um, separating out the parts of the life cycle. There's multiple reasons that this approach makes sense, especially a, a focus on more distributed, smaller scale operations. Insects can get sick. So it's been interesting navigating a pandemic that is affecting humans because we have already been managing a lot of diseases that affect insects at our facility. So we've actually operationally had to change very little because we've already been taking a lot of the precautions that are being advised now from a decontamination standpoint um, to manage disease and uh, other risks of our insects. Um, FRAS is a huge uh, by volume, a huge component of what we do. So we actually produce three to 12 times more frass by volume than our insect feed product. So being close to fertilizer customers is really key. And we see this with other uh, animal production systems where that manure product can really become uh, more of a cost and more of a problem than an opportunity for more revenue. Um, by having more distributed production, we can co-locate with feedstocks. Um, this further reduces the greenhouse gas footprint of our products because we're using less uh, fossil fuels to transport these different ingredients around. Um, having diversified risks mean we can, means we can have simplified construction. If you have one giant location, it needs to be sort of the Fort Knox for bugs. You have to make sure nothing's getting in, nothing's getting out. You have a lot more cost in how you're building. By having more diversified operations, we can actually have simpler construction and it's cheaper. We can also more smoothly expand with demand. Um, there's a lot of challenges right now, a lot of, you know, instead of chicken egg, we call them bug egg problems, where, you know, the customer wants a certain volume of production before they'll make a commitment, um, but you need to have those commitments before you can build. So being able to sort of more smoothly line up that supply and demand is something that's an opportunity when you have diversified production like this. Um, and ultimately, it just allows us for, to have a lot more flexibility. Um, so I've highlighted a few areas that we've been looking to locate our facilities. Um, here in the Pacific Northwest, we've actually got a very exciting project co-locating with waste heat production at a server farm. So our current flagship facility is going to take waste heat from a data center to reduce our electrical needs at our flagship facility. We have opportunities to co-locate co with byproduct feedstocks, including um, products from biorefineries. I think being close to frass customers is really important in some geographies so that that frass, those fertilizer products aren't moving very far. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunity in just underutilized infrastructure around the country. Um, we see a lot of opportunity in poultry and swine houses as well as warehouses. So I just wanted to outline a little bit um, how this supply chain looks. We're currently building our flagship facility in Kashmir, Washington. Um, this is initially going to operate as a production facility, but it's designed to be our first hub or the first hatchery in our supply chain. Um, we can quickly build out these modular ranches around the country using uh, our license designs, partnering with uh, OEMs and local contractors to really be able to build these operations quickly. Um, so a very turnkey solution. Ranchers work with our team for uh, training, support, quality control, troubleshooting, and so they don't need to have all the infrastructure of, say, a lab at their location. They can really work with us um, at our flagship here. Eggs, um, which are fairly small, can be air mailed from our hatchery to ranches, um, and, you know, what we're talking about is, is effectively a pitcher full of eggs turning into uh, a couple pallets worth of uh, insect biomass after it's been grown out. So, we can be quickly moving the, the smaller uh, weight and volume product to those ranchers. So eggs get sent to ranchers. Um, feed is formulated and sourced by beta hatch so that we can control those inputs because this is a, a huge determinator of our cost and a big component of the risk factor of an operation. So by working with uh, local producers, we can get the right feedstock to those ranchers depending on their location. Frass and feed are sold through beta hatch channels. So that means that our ranchers don't need to be uh, worrying about sales and marketing. 
um, and we can emphasize customers that are close to those ranchers. Um, really trying to shorten the you know, distances that these products have to be moving. Um, you know, from an operating and financial standpoint, you know, just want to highlight sort of how this breaks down. This is, gives you a sense of the components of uh, cost. I think often when we talk about alternative proteins and some of these new technologies, that cost of capital is not really incorporated into the cost of the product. And so this is leading to a lot of inflated um, expectations around some of these new ingredients where it's true if we could cut out this cost of capital, we'd be extremely cost competitive from the get-go. Um, and so I think this is one of the reasons we also like this more distributed model. So, you know, the rancher, um, they'll be buying eggs and feed from Beta Hatch. So feed and eggs being a, a major component of that cost, of course. Um, but, you know, they are securing financing through their own channels, which reduces that cost of capital. They own and operate the ranch, which gives them um, some certainty around uh, the economic investment that they're making. And, uh, you know, we've got a brownfield approach to production. So really thinking about taking an existing structure and outfitting that um, using local labor, on-farm labor that they already have. Uh, right now, the current model we're, we're exploring is around a 30,000 square foot footprint, um, which would cost around $3 million to build and can generate revenues in excess of $5 million a year. Um, but we've also been starting to explore some other scales of operation, looking at, say, a single poultry house or a single swine house and how we could modify that to make it uh, a financially interesting proposition for a rancher. Um, we pay the rancher for their products, so they buy feed and eggs from us, they run that operation, and then we buy back all the products from them, both the frass and the mealworms as the feed product. Um, and we give them a, a, hard, a hard, larger percentage of the sale as they're paying off their investment. Um, and then we uh, adjust the split of how we're um, distributing the, those revenues across uh, Beta Hatch and across our ranchers after they've paid off their facility. So this allows them, instead of having to have you know, a 20 year um, uh, facility that they're slowly paying off, to quickly pay off their investments and then start generating some really predictable revenues uh, and cash flow for their farms. The value of this approach and just insects in general uh, becomes clear when we start looking at these different, um, I guess, different components of these products in the feed supply chain. So, you know, on the right here, we've got our plant proteins, soy, we've got fish meal. Um, and, you know, these are um, tried and true ingredients that we are starting to see some challenges around the price of fish meal, um, predictability of uh, any kind of land-based crop is going to be become very challenging as the climate starts to fluctuate. Um, and the seasonality in particular is something that a lot of these alternative proteins being developed eliminates. Um, we can see that there's, there's single-celled systems, you know, um, the callistas of the world and algal producers who also are able to eliminate that seasonal component to what they're doing. But where Beta Hatch and our approach really differentiates is on the cost of facilities and equipment. So all of these other operations are extremely expensive because they have which is a very high capital investment to get uh, the, the kind of throughputs that are needed for the animal feed industry. Um, the stability of, of um, predictability of production also can sometimes be challenging when you have one centralized facility um, as opposed to having a more distributed model where that risk is distributed. And so our approach um, results in the most capital efficient and stable production of those alternative proteins. The competitive landscape uh, is complex, but you know, one of the things that I just want to highlight for those that on the call that might already be familiar uh, as far as that investment, um, the investments that have been made in this space, you know, we, there's a lot of buzz around um, alternative proteins on the food side, uh, beyond meats and some of those uh, players. And in that alternative, you know, some of these alternative protein markets, we're seeing um, you know, single percent investments relative to that total market opportunity. Animal feed has uh, been underfunded um, considerably, uh, and you know even if you were to update this number of some of the more recent financings, we're still you know just at a fraction of the kind of investment relative to that market opportunity. So there's a huge market, there's a huge opportunity, and there are going to be multiple winners. Um, there's a couple of these uh, earlier movers um, that have been um, taking down a lot of these barriers on the regulatory side, building market. Um, helping to spread the word about how insects are you know, incredibly valuable 
product for the animal feed markets. And so Beta Hatch was really drafting uh, in, in the success of these early leaders. You know, ultimately, I think it's still anyone's game that there's going to be, it's going to come down to who is the best operator. Um, and so this is why we've really focused on capital efficiency of our facilities. We've got the dry adapted mealworm that is uh, a much more simple insect to grow. Um, ultimately, this is a more scalable solution. Um, if you were to ask how many of these other companies have built, you know, 10 facilities, the answer is none yet. Um, and I think it's taken a long time because they're very expensive facilities for them to be scaling. Beta Hatch has focused on a smaller scale of operation that can more quickly um, get to scale. Um, another thing I just wanted to touch on is the sort of message of sustainability. I think that in the uh, alternative protein sector, this continually is something that gets discussed, you know, hey, it's a more sustainable alternative. When it comes down to it, we're actually pretty efficient at producing ingredients like soy, um, you know, fairly limited water, um, you know, very, very little electricity. Um, you know, these are, are generally uh, fairly, um, when we do kind of a full life cycle analysis, um, you know, not entirely unsustainable uh, by any means. It's just that there's a lot of opportunity for insects to really cut the, that impact even more. Um, I just want to highlight some of these numbers coming from peer reviewed um, life cycle analyses, you know, just really depends on how those operators are producing. Um, and it really comes back to what are those insects eating? That's a major component of um, the impact. What's the heating load and electrical use? So really, how is that operation working? And this is why, you know, we've been really focusing on waste-based or really low value inputs and also focusing on ways that we can be more energy efficient in our facility. So because we're, we're sourcing waste-based feedstocks and it's a dry adapted beetle, we're anticipating um, a very, very minimal water use um, at our, uh, in, our, in our operations. Um, we have also, uh, because you know, we're looking at taking ingredients that would otherwise be landfilled, ultimately having some positive contributions to what the CO2 impacts, the greenhouse gas footprint is gonna be of these products. And that density component really comes back to what is the technology? for how we're growing these bugs. Um, our facility currently is delivering it up to 500 times the acre yield of soy. So some incredible efficiency out of a small footprint uh, location. And again, that really novel use of waste heat is allowing us to reduce the electrical needs and that footprint um, from a, an energy standpoint. And as we adapt our systems to different climates, um, you know, we, we've been approaching, approaching the engineering in a way that allows us to really maximize those efficiencies. So, you know, Beta Hatch is really a supply chain solution that gives stability to the food system. You know, this is an incredibly unprecedented disruptive time. And some of the things that uh, I, I make, make me very excited about the business that we're building is that, you know, all of these changes of course happened, a lot of disruption in our business, but Ultimately, we, we just kept working because people still need to eat. Um, you know, this is an essential business and there's really an essential need for that supply chain to be able to weather all kinds of different disruptions. Um, you know, the ranching approach that we have adds stability. So we had already, you know, we've been developing this approach for the last four years. Um, and, you know, we were even more convinced of how important that diversification um, and distribution of our operations are to adding stability to that supply chain. The mealworm is a hardy species. You know, we did an analysis. Do we have to shut off our, if we had to shut off our, uh, our system, shut down the farm, have no one going in, what would this look like? And we could actually leave those bugs for several months without needing to go in and have a human handling them. This is very different than a black soldier fly that would just fly away. So there's some real opportunities there as far as um, giving some robustness to that risk profile of the ingredients. And ultimately, the more predictable the production is, the lower risk that we're going to see. And our incredibly high density uh, of data analysis um, and um, the, the operation that we've been building, the technology that we've been developing is allowing us to produce these proteins in a very predictable way. So um, that's just a, a real fast and quick synopsis of some of the work that Beta Hatch is doing, how we're planning to scale our supply chain. Um, and I'd love to take some questions. Thank you, Virginia. Fascinating stuff and insightful talk. Um, 
So for all the participants, um, if you would like to ask a question, uh, feel free to uh, type it into the Q&A uh, field you see at the bottom, or you can, uh, I believe, raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, but please, um, let's get the questions rolling in. Regina, I guess to start it off, did you, can you, can you describe the, the, the kind of the protein content on a, on a uh, per volume basis relative to, you know, fish meal and, and some others? Sure. Um, I've actually got a whole slide on that. Um, the, uh, let me pull that up real quick. So, um, you know, when we look at the established ingredients that are in the sector, you know, fish meal in particular is the one that we see the most parallels to. Um, and I should say also fish oil. I think there's a lot of emphasis on protein when we talk about insects, but they are a very high fat ingredient as well. So there's an opportunity to replace not just the protein component of the diet, but also the lipid component of the diet. Um, we see a energy density that is very high, um, certainly higher than what we typically see with fish meal. Um, and the amino acid profile is um, you know, fairly complete uh, as well. You know, it's a complete amino acid profile, um, but also a higher protein content generally. Um, the sulfur containing amino acids that tend to be um, the most limiting in a lot of diets, these are actually ingredients that we can also be manipulating through both breeding and some process changes in our operation. And so we can actually get an ingredient that is very comparable, uh, if not superior to fish meal or certainly soy meal. So what does that mean for, for the percentage protein? So our ingredients are generally somewhere between 55 and 60% protein um, and about 30% fat. So it's a very um, high protein ingredient. Got it. Any other questions from the attendees? Oh man, this is a first, not getting any questions. Um, you know, I think if anyone's interested in, in following up as well, you know, my, my email is just virginia at betahatch.com. Um, I think it's important that, you know, feel free to ask those tough questions because uh, I'm very much open to um, any, any discussion here. I think it's important that novel protein producers are talking about some of these um, things like the cost of capital, um, you know, how the product compares on a cost basis, some of these questions. Great. We have some trickling in. Um, Tom Gable says, fascinating technology. Given the increasing focus on food safety and traceability, what is the expectation for your product to maintain preservation qualities? Yeah, great question. So it's a um, dried product. We, we have an opportunity for a fresh supply chain as well. Some of our pet food customers have expressed an interest in uh, more of like a meat-based ingredient. Um, as a dry product though, it's got a, a very long lifespan. We're doing some shelf life testing right now and um, other ingredients that I've seen that are insect-based come, come back with, uh, in some cases, over a year of, um, of lifespan of that ingredient. Um, a lot of it comes back to, of course, what that fat content looks like. Um, and so typically we'd be defatting the protein component of the ingredient um, and using that to, um, using that protein component separately from the lipid component. Um, from a safety and traceability standpoint though, I should say this is uh, the kind of ingredients that is going to far surpass the traceability and the safety of you know, fish meal, for example. Um, we know exactly what we're putting in. We know exactly how we are producing. We have um, very sophisticated um, big data type approaches to managing our production. Um, and you know, this is very much a food grade um, production. And so a very, we have pretty much control over every part of that process. And that's something that is going to ensure that we have very, very high traceability and of course safety. Great. Steve Klein asks, what is the status of your Cashmere Washington facility? 
Yeah, I've got actually, let me um, just jump to the, um, I, I had sort of a supporting slide here. So we are um, working right now to finalize the design uh, of this facility. Um, you know, we were able with our seed funding to build a pre-commercial facility um, in SeaTac. Um, and so this is just a little snapshot of what that looks like. Um, it's about a ton uh, per month capacity at this location. Um, and this has allowed us to design the flagship facility. So we have been able to develop our technology at scale. Um, now with the, our Series A funding, we're starting the construction on a Kashmir location. This is a flagship facility um, about two hours east of Seattle. Um, and this is just a, a bit of a mock-up of what that facility will look like. This isn't an old juice factory. I'm sitting in the building right now, actually, um, that we're converting. It's been sitting empty for almost a dec more than a decade, um, and we are now revitalizing this space. It's about a 30,000 square foot warehouse. Um, design and pre-construction started in 2019. Um, we're um, effectively at, at the point we can be contracting that work. Um, we're just working to secure the last financing to start the full construction, but we've already taken steps on some pre-construction and um, actually an intermediate construction step that's gonna allow us to amplify our population before we go into the full-scale operation. Um, and that facility is poised to start expanding uh, egg as an egg production facility uh, and a hatchery and hub for our supply chain in 2021. Great. David Nothman, says, Virginia, thank you for providing a compelling case for alternative feed. On your slide comparing your product to others from land mass, energy, et cetera, rather than words, it would be helpful to see the comparable numbers. So I don't know if you have that now, but uh, perhaps you and David, if not, can uh, connect later on that Yeah, one. I'd be happy to connect. I don't have a slide that specifically pulls out those numbers. Um, I do think, so yeah, we have a very detailed analysis that compares these different products and ingredients. I think one of the um, things just to highlight is that a lot of this comes back to, you know, a lot of these conversations come back to cost. Okay, well, how expensive is your product? Um, we're currently producing at around $6,000 a ton. At the flagship facility, that first ton that comes off the line will be about 3,000 a ton. A lot of that's just been from changing the inputs that we're using. Um, and that's almost, accounting for very little of the automation. So we actually anticipate that within the first year of operation, we can really drive that cost down even further, potentially dipping below a, a 2,000 a ton price point, which is where we start getting into some interesting competitive territory with fish meal. Um, I think from a, um, a standpoint nutritionally, um, what we see is that uh, from an amino acid profile standpoint, energy density, um, fatty acid profile, um, we can get effectively comparable results to uh, comparable profiles to fish meal and fish oil. Um, but one of the things that is not always accounted for is also this value add. So we're seeing things like improved feed conversion of other components of the diet through prebiotic value in the gut. Um, and so when we look at that and think about the overall cost of the product, um, it's really on a what's the the value to the farmer basis. Um, I think that we're going to see insect protein continue to be at a premium um, on a per ton basis because we're seeing a premium on a value basis. Great. Steve Klein asks, have you considered the hub and spoke application to pet food? Yes. Um, of course, uh, pet food, I think, is an incredible opportunity. Um, there's a lot of trends that follow human food. Um, I should you know, say that the reason that we're not focused on human food is because the market's very small and there's a lot of marketing challenges. Um, but in some ways, the marketing for insects, uh, it's almost, you know, it's, it's very obvious that animals would rather be eating insects than some of these other ingredients that we're using. For pets in particular, the sustainability, component, the fact that this is a hypoallergenic ingredient, make it a very appealing ingredient for the pet market. Um, and so that hub and spoke approach of being able to locate our facilities next to customers, we were talking with um, um, one of the customers that is first to market with insect based pet foods, who is really keen to be thinking about how we can be producing for them specifically um, next to their facility that manufactures the um, their diets. And so by shortening those supply chains, you know, you save 
not just on the fossil fuel side, but also on a cost basis. You know, I think that the um, cost of freight in a lot of feed formulations is not always accounted for. And I think by having a more distributed hub and spoke approach, we can actually be saving the customer a lot uh, on that transportation basis. Kent Johnson asks, what pushbacks are you getting from poultry and aquaculture farmers? Um, yeah, I, great question. Uh, I would say the biggest, um, I guess, questions or challenges that we get from customers are, what's the volume that you can produce and when can I get it? So they want more volume than we can make. And I think that's always, um, that's been a challenge for the entire industry. It's a very supply limited industry. Um, we have uh, one customer who has said their entire, their monthly demand for insect protein today, this is with very little sort of market push, um, but current pool market from the demands on a monthly basis um, exceeds the yearly global supply of insects. So if every insect farmer in the world um, took everything they produce in a year and they could only sell through one month of demand from this customer. So I think it's a very supply limited industry right now. There's a huge amount of demand. So I think that's one of the challenges is just being able to quickly um, amplify and get to those scales. Um, and so that's, again, one of the reasons that we've um, taken an approach that we can be you know, scaling as quickly as that demand um, is, but also uh, be sort of matching their process. A lot of our customers uh, need a lot of testing um, and product development. And so being able to match supply and demand more closely is one of the real opportunities with our hub and spoke approach. We also get a lot of pushback, of course, on price. I think this is a really high uh, value ingredients. And so being able to um, you know, convince someone to switch off of something that they're used to that has been at a, a certain expected price point and in a lot of cases subsidized price point, you need to be very clearly showing that value and that, um, I guess, certainty around production. And just by nature of being a new industry, um, I think there's some challenges in doing that for customers, but I think we're going to be overcoming those challenges in the next year or two. So um, as an industry, it's a really exciting time to be producing insects. Terrific. Well, um, if there are no more questions, Virginia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. All the attendees, thank you for joining us. As a reminder, we host these calls every week or every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. Um, so please uh, look out for upcoming events and feel free to let other folks know um, if you think they'd be interested in this because uh, it is recorded and will be available for replay. Yeah, thank you. And um, everyone, if you need to, if you had a question or want to follow up, Virginia at betahatch.com. You can reach me and just betahatch.com for some more information about the business. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.